art and science come closest in the field of telecommunications. When scientists understood waves, the art of broadcasting and recording became possible. And science is now about to take these miracles of communication into a new age, an age in which waves will be recorded and transmitted with absolute fidelity and total clarity. At the right speed, vibrating objects can generate sound waves. These are matter waves. Like ripples on the surface of a liquid, they can spread through the air from the source of the vibration. The sound of the flute comes from the turbulent, vibrating airflow inside. That's produced by the performer's skill and the instrument's shape. The result is a rapidly alternating compression and stretching of the air in the room. These vibrations show as a graph on the oscilloscope. Whenever molecules are forced to vibrate, waves travel out from the disturbance. Some are stretched out, some are tight, but they all travel at a steady speed and the constancy of that speed is important. The faster the vibration, the closer the waves. The shorter, the wave length, in fact. It's the frequency, or speed of vibration, and the wave length that determine the pitch of the sound that you hear. The loudness depends on something else, the depth of the wave. But the trace of the oscilloscope shows more than just the depth and spacing of the waves. They have a constantly changing shape of their own, and it's that which gives them their characteristic sound. That's all there is to natural sound, but to transmit it over great distances calls for the special properties of another family of waves. These are solar flares. You are watching matter being smashed into electrically charged fragments by the tremendous heat inside the sun. At solar temperatures, these submicroscopic charged particles are forced to vibrate energetically. And that's what produces the light. Light belongs to the electromagnetic wave family. Electromagnetic waves are paradoxical because in some ways they're more like microscopic bullets. They don't need matter in which to travel. So unlike sound waves, they can move through empty space. As with matter waves, it's the distance between crests that decides what form the energy will take. At one end of the scale are cosmic rays. They are so closely spaced that atoms seem large. At the other end of the scale are the longest radio waves with lengths measured in thousands of kilometers. Between these extremes, any wavelength is possible. There's a continuous spectrum. As you move through the spectrum of wavelengths from the shortest cosmic rays through gamma rays, X-rays and ultraviolet, most of the radiation is completely invisible to the human eye. It's only a narrow band with lengths around the size of the largest molecules that we see. The longer waves, beyond visible red light, are invisible again. And it's here, in the radio part of the spectrum, that man has discovered how to boost the waves artificially and make them continuous. That way, they become an ideal probe and messenger. Since the early part of the century, messages have been encoded in radio waves to cover vast distances at the speed of light. The depth of the radio wave varies with the information in the message. These are analog transmissions. They deliver a continuous copy of the shape of a wave. And not only sound, 
any information can be carried in the form of an electrical analog. For example, this is the pattern of color, light and darkness that makes up the television picture. But sadly, these analog transmissions are vulnerable to distortion and damage. Analog communications have served us well, but to get rid of interference, a new approach is needed. Strangely, the key idea has been around for years. This is the computer code of the 18th century. Think how the music of the distant past has reached us. There was no sound recording. A composer wrote down his instructions as a score and generations of live performers interpreted them. The composer's instructions have been transmitted not in analog form, but as a set of coded signals. Today's computers, too, need a code. They can't easily handle analog information, but they thrive on the on-off code of digital pulses. Today, sound and pictures can be coded in digital form. To translate waveforms to computer code calls for the analog to digital converter, the hero of the new age of communication. What it does is sample the analog wave at regular intervals. At each of the sample points, the converter picks up an electrical voltage, a number, that represents a measurement of the wave's depth. Computer circuits handle numbers on the modern equivalent of the abacus. The beads on the abacus are electrical pulses. They represent powers of the number two. So just a few pulses can deal with a huge range of values. That's only the beginning of the process. Pulses in a multiplicity of parallel wires are fine inside computer circuits, but for transmission, they must be reorganized into serial form a single stream in a single channel. Then at the receiving end, the whole process is reversed. Digital pulses resist interference because computer circuits can recognize their own code and ignore false data. Listen, you become aware of this great advantage of digital transmission when the pulses are weakened. As long as it is still there, even at one-tenth its original strength, the digitally coded message can still produce an undistorted signal, loud and clear. The digital revolution has only just begun, but one thing is clear. Sound and pictures will never be the same again.